Praise the Lord. I had a brother in the Lord. Um, actually, I have him, but I was use the word had because he, we, he and I had a conversation this last summer, and he asked me this question. He said, how do you prepare uh, for, for church? How do you prepare for service? And I really enjoyed that question because the answer is, first, when I decided to, to try to process this answer, I was thinking about his heart and how I could share something that might impact his life. And then I had to ask myself, how, how do you prepare? And the answer was, it was quite simple. It's daily fellowship. It's daily fellowship with the Lord. See, early when I heard the voice of the Lord in my heart years and years ago about ministering, I had a willingness in my heart and I heard some scripture and as I was reading this, God spoke right to my heart about, about what it was that I was supposed to do as it pertained to a church service that was coming up and the person that was going to lead wasn't going to be there. In fact, we had made a commitment to, to have a service. Uh, back then, we didn't actually have a, a church um, per se. We would gather at a local athletic venue in Eugene and visit, oh, every once, once every six or eight weeks. But we had made this commitment to do it twice a month, bare minimum. And the person that was going to lead was going to be out of the country for six months. They found out this information after we had made this commitment. My dear sister, she's wonderful. And I remember her sharing with me after we'd made this commitment. We were so fired up about talking about the Lord and gathering together. And I was like, oh, man, it's like I just couldn't get enough of the Lord. And I would sit there kind of in a seat like for you guys, and I would just listen. And, oh, it was so good. And, and months, a couple months later, she said, brother, we're, we're, we're going to be in Africa for six months. And I'm thinking, that's awesome. And I hung up the phone, and I went, not so much. <laughs> well, what about what we had committed to? And I thought, you know, I'm going to seek the Lord first. Seek the Lord first. I said, Lord, what do you want? What do you, what do you want? Who's going to do this? And deep down, my spirit knew, but it hadn't floated up to the consciousness of my mind yet to grab a hold of that which my spirit had already known. But I just kept pressing in, and I read that word in, in the book of Isaiah, and it said, who will go out for me? God asked the question. Who will go? And Isaiah answered and said, I will, Lord. I will. When I heard that, oh, man, the Spirit of God just jumped up inside of me, and I was so excited. I was like, this is awesome. This, I remember exactly where I was at. I remember the day. I remember how I felt. I remember hearing the revelation in my heart. It was so awesome. I had no idea what I was going to talk about. And as the time got closer to our first service, I remember that night before, and I came home, and I had a full day's work, and I thought, I'm just going to get in the presence of the Lord. And this is literally what I did. What am I going to talk about? So I go in there. I look in the Bible, because we should talk about the Bible. That was a given. I was like, okay, I got the first step down, but what could I talk about? Maybe love, and I started to look up love, or maybe joy, maybe peace, maybe strength, and I started to look all these things up and go into concordance, and, and it was this beep, flat line spiritually. Nothing was happening. It was just like, I was like, wow, this is, so I, I had shared with my wife, you know, after I'd gotten home from work that I was going to go spend some time with the Lord. And I realized that comment probably sounded great. I'm going to go spend time with the Lord, thy God, and get close to him and hear what he might have to say. Man, there was so much fear going on inside of me because I didn't know what, what, what was going to happen, but I knew to get into his presence. And when I got into his presence, it wasn't, it wasn't for a, three hours before I felt his presence. And I'd spent this time, I had worship going in my ears, I was praying in the Holy Ghost, and I was looking up scripture, and nothing was happening. And I just like, it's tomorrow. I gotta work tomorrow, and it's tomorrow night. I got nothing. How many of you ever walked through life and really wanted to seek 
God and needed some answers and you're trusting him and you know that he's good. You, he know, you know that he has an answer, but it's just like your, your mind is just flatlined. There's just nothing going on. Am I alone? No. I'm sharing this with you because today's the Lord. I woke up this morning and this just started floating up out of my spirit. As soon as my eyes opened up this morning, I started to hear friend, friend, friend. What does it mean to you when you hear the word friend? Friend. I love Pop's answer. He, he. Happy early anniversary, Mom and Pops, by the way. Tomorrow is their anniversary, and the birthday. day of love. Pops and Pops' birthday. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Little side note, not a digression. Uh, how many years tomorrow? Oh, 76. 17 years? 17 years. Ooh. Oh, my birthday. Praise God. <laughs> when I met Pops uh, about 18 years ago... <laughs> I, I, he would say these things like when people would ask him, how you doing? He's like, I'm blessed and nothing less. And I said, oh, that sounds like the right thing to say. <laughs> what do you think about Jesus? His answer, he's my friend. And that was his response to everything. I thought, oh, that's, that's a great answer, Pops. But there were times that I thought, good for you, but I, I just, I don't know. Jesus is my friend. I want him to be. Hmm. So when we look to the Lord, there sometimes we can gather in the name of the, of the Lord, but we don't know that or have the revelation that he could, he could be, but more importantly, wants to be our friend. When I went to sleep that night, I, I laid my head on the pillow and... I was, there was so much fear starting to well up inside of me because I didn't have something to say. But I remembered that day that the Lord told me in my heart when I heard that question and I said, I'll go. I was so full of joy. I just wanted to go. But in that moment, that night, it was, I was, I might as well have been a block of ice. So cold, literally, physically. I laid on my side and I was just like, wow. And I, I remembered just going, what, what do I got? And the reason I'm sharing this with you is because people like to marry methods to study something, to learn something. And you can't have a method in your natural mind and in your natural effort to understand who God is. God is a spirit. He's beautiful. He's, he's so powerful. He's so full of joy. He's so full of strength. He's so full of all the answers that you need. And yet we'll try to open them like a safe and see what kind of contents are in there. There's no combination other than just knowing that he's in your heart and trusting and letting go of your own thoughts and your own self. I learned one of the most powerful spiritual lessons that night before I started this walk of ministry. And I laid there I turned off the worship, and I'm like, I, 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 it's getting so late, I just have to, I have to sleep. And I laid there, and I tossed, and I turned, and I, when I usually go to sleep, I go to sleep. Sometimes people, oh, I go to bed, but what time did you fall asleep? You ever been there, and, okay, did I remember that? Did I lock the door? Okay, I got to do this in the morning. And pretty soon, midnight. You're in bed, but you're not asleep. And for me, usually when my head hits that pillow, out. Not that night. Tossing, turning. And I remember in the garden of my heart hearing the voice of the Lord. God is had given me not the spirit of fear, which was physically present in my mind. I was just filled with fear. What am I going to say? What am I going to say when I go up there for the first time? He did not give you the spirit of fear. And I recognized as I heard that, that that's the condition that I was in. But he gave you the spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. What I learned from that is that fear is a spirit. Fear is a spirit. 
power, love, and a sound mind are also a spirit, and you can bear the fruit by trusting in the Lord. And as I kept hearing that, and deep, deep down, my body was literally cold. I was laying on my side in a fetal position, and by that point, tears were coming out of my eyes. I'm like, what did I sign up for? What did I do? I have nothing to talk about, but that kind of kept coming up, kept coming up, kept coming up. And pretty soon, that voice just got louder and louder and louder, and then it just came out of my mouth. God, you didn't give me a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. And it was the very first time in my life that I almost heard the audible voice of God inside me, so loud, so powerful, so strong. He said, get on your knees. Ooh. Worship. Worship is getting down and humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God. And when I got on my knees, he began to speak to me. He began to love on me. He said, don't worry. Don't worry. I just had a moment there, and I just, all of a sudden, the fear just left. I got up. I crawled back into bed, and I fell asleep. I didn't know what I was going to say still, but the peace of God had been replaced, had replaced the fear that was in me, thinking, what am I going to do? How am I going to walk? How am I going to go? And the reason I'm sharing this with you is you have a friend in Jesus who wants to guide and love you every single day. And see, if you have the ear for a friend, a true friend, an intimate relationship with Jesus as your friend, you will hear things in a moment that will pull you through any situation. I've shared a little bit about this testimony before, but even to the moment I stepped up behind that little podium in that athletic club, I still had no idea what I was going to say. And I stood up there, and a handful of people came in, and right in that moment, the Lord said, share your testimony. And he actually prodded me to get away from behind the podium, grab a chair, and tell everybody to get in a circle. And I began to share the testimony of how I came to know God. So when this brother asked me this question last summer, I had... I've been walking a few years since that first time that I described, but here's what's changed as I begin to develop this relationship with my friend. The Webster Dictionary defines friend, the Webster 1828 version. I can't help but say that when I refer to Webster because this, this is what Noah Webster was a Christian a man that loved the word of God, that knew words were seeds, and that every definition that he gave, he knew that it came from God himself. He knew that as he defined that, that it was a way of communication for people to trade seeds with each other, these words. Today, when you read a lot of dictionaries, you don't see scripture in there. They're, they're, it's been taken away. So it's, it's, it's the reading the Webster in 1828 is very intimate, and he shares this, no, Webster, in this definition. One who is attached to another by affection. One who entertains for another sentiments of esteem, respect, and affection, which lead him to desire his company. How can you get close to a God that you don't know? And there are so many people that are saved, but they walk through this life without a relationship. It's more religion, which is exterior. Go to church, say your prayers, do these things, but they don't have the intimate relationship with the Lord to hear the voice to guide them through the needs that they have on any given day. Jesus said in the book of Mark, chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, Hmm. 
Mark 1, 14, 15. Most of you are familiar with the book of Mark. You're also very familiar that when a minister refers to a chapter and a verse, it's, it's for reference. And it's wonderful. Translators took the original scriptures, the holy scriptures, and in the New Testament it was written in Greek, and they added chapter and verse, and then they referenced it to other verses and other chapters. All those numbers, chapter 1, verse this, chapter 2, 3, verse that, 4, all this stuff, that was never there. I'm sharing that with you for this specific reason, that this is how we can walk our walk with chapter and verse and numbers, but when you read God's word as a love letter, hmm, that when you just open it up and read it, like the first time someone you love gave you a little sugar on paper. Can you imagine writing your spouse or somebody you loved a love letter and then putting a number by every sentence? (laughs) Sentence one. I'm so happy that I met you. (laughs) Sentence two, and I'm sure that you're happy that you met me. Sentence three, and so on. You would read that, and if somebody wrote you a love letter like that, you would go, you're weird. You are weird. Why? It can detach from the spirit of love in which it's written. And the reason I'm sharing this is oftentimes when you can read scripture, we go, oh, chapter one, verse, and we beat ourselves up because we don't remember that. And so then we kind of have this distance between reading it like God's speaking to you. That was just a little side nugget. (laughs) So Mark chapter one, verse 14 and 15. Jesus began his ministry speaking this. And after John the Baptist was put into prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is the very first thing that Jesus went out after the Holy Spirit descended on him. He went out into the desert for 40 days. And when he came in in the power of the Holy Spirit, this is what he began to say. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, repent, repent. That word repent comes from the Greek word metanoia. It means change the way you think. See, you've been living a life and you're, you're let's assume that you're, you've given your life to the Lord and, and the Holy Spirit has come and dwelt in your heart and, and God, you've been reconciled to him through the acceptance of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The Bible tells you at that point that you become a spiritual infant. That This is why it says that you're born again. I heard this, fra- this, this phrasing way before I gave my life to born again, one of them, you know. And, but when you're born again, it means, it means not entering back into the womb like Nicodemus thought, one of the scribes or one of the Pharisees that, that went and seen Jesus at night. It wasn't that way. Jesus was talking about the spirit. He said that you're born an infant spiritually. That's why the scripture says, desire the pure milk of the word. See that as you begin to nourish your spirit on on spiritual food, which is the the word of God speaking to you, that, that, that as you read that, it comes down and waters those seeds that it can bear more fruit, that you have more revelation of who God is. And God wants to tell you that I've sent my son and he wants to be your friend. He wants to be able to talk to you. See, sometimes we can get into a place where we just need to hear the voice of somebody else. And, and, and we call on friends. There's that show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Answer the question, yes, sir. See, and, and when they get stumped, they have, this, they have this out. You can call a friend. Why? Because this friend might have knowledge that, that, that can align up with your knowledge but get you going in the right direction. But see, a natural friend and a person can never feel the place of who Jesus is because he is all-knowing, has all the answers. So oftentimes when storms hit us, we'll call a friend and we'll seek the counsel of, of what somebody else might think. And we may, it may be a trusted person, but oftentimes we're, we're, we're wanting an answer and we want to collaborate. And let me just bounce this off you. And they'll say something and you, mm, you discern it. But the friend 
that Jesus wants to be is somebody that can give you direction right in that moment, specific, not shotgunning ideas, not throwing a bunch of stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. It's none of that. It's very specific, very accurate, very precise, hearing the friend in the voice of God. So when Jesus said repent, he says change the way you think. And as it pertains to this, change the way you think about your friends. Your natural friends that you have, they're wonderful. But there's a friend in Jesus that can allow you to love them even better because of who he'll tell you who you are and in him. That when a friend calls you for advice, that as you're listening to the friend Jesus in your heart, you'll be able to give them something that will change their life forever. Give them perspective. Train them to do something that, that they never thought that they could do. And they're like, oh, I love that friend. But pretty soon you'll be able to have the opportunity to say, the Lord told me to tell you that. See, this brother in the Lord that asked me that, I perceived when he asked me that question, how do I prepare, is because he saw fruit in my life. All glory to God, but he saw fruit. It wasn't like, how do you prepare? Because look at you. It was like, how do you prepare? And it's fellowship with the Lord. In John 15, Jesus said this to the disciples, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. In John 15, it started, it's starting to get towards the point of time where Jesus was heading to the cross. It's a vast difference with his relationship with the disciples at that point than when he first met them. See, when he first met them, they called him good teacher, rabbi. Good teacher, why they, they were, he was teaching them stuff. The very first disciples, Andrew and his brother Nathaniel, they had heard about this Jesus. They were there when he was baptized. They knew, Andrew knew John the Baptist. He was walking with John the Baptist, in fact, the day after Jesus was baptized, and John said, again, behold, the Lamb of God. And Andrew went and followed Jesus. And then Andrew went to his brother and said, there's this man, the man in which the Old Testament spoke of, the book of Moses, the Christ, the Messiah. And Nathaniel was like, hmm, don't know about that. He says, come and see. He went reluctantly. And when you read the scriptures, it, Jesus describes Nathaniel coming and he starts to speak to his heart. And Nathaniel goes, how did you know this about me? See, Jesus knows you before you know him. He's already intimate with you because he created you. He is God. He knew you before you were in your mother's womb. That's how intimate he is. So all the years that you may have spent not walking with him, he was there. He knew. Not worried or fearful, oh God, they gotta know me. How do I, oh, how do I get these people? No, he already set a plan. People are, well, God's got a plan. His plan is that all men be reconciled to him. But he can't do anything outside of your will or a person's will. So it's when a person submits their will and gets on their knees and says, none of me, Lord, all of you. That is a point of humility where God can start speaking to you. Amen. And when he spoke to Nathaniel, he told him, before you came, I saw you sitting under a tree. Nathaniel's like, how did he know this? How did he know this? He must be the one. And he gathered the disciples to him. Disciples, what are they? Disciplined ones. Learning the ways of the Lord. He discipled them. He showed them miracles. He talked to them. He often said, you of little faith, meaning you're doing good, you're walking on water, then you shut it off and you begin to sink. But he was always just a hand length away. And he began to walk with them and love on them and show them how to love and teach them that this whole life is about love. And in John 15, I would encourage you to read this. Jesus talks about that he is the vine, we are the branches, that we need to abide in him. He uses this word abide like 12 times in those verses. 
abide in me, abide in me, let my love abide in you. This is, he was literally saying friendship. Let's be friends. And he went on to say, literally, I have called you friends. No longer are you disciples. No longer will you call me good teacher, but you will call me friend. See, John, who wrote the book of John, had this revelation. He refers to himself, the disciple in whom Jesus loved. <laughs> well, that's kind of, he had revelation. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. If you went about your day just with that thought and confessing that and letting it get down in the garden of your heart, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. When you have a need or a question answered or you're just in a foul mood, Jesus loves me. See, when you're in a foul mood, you want to scratch what the flesh wants. You want to vent. But to allow your spirit to bypass that and come out and speak the words, Jesus loves me, love will push out fear. See, when you're angry and, and strifeful and things are going on, that falls under the umbrella of fear. It does. Fear just separates. Separates you from the love of God. But in that moment, if you could just say, Jesus loves me, I had a sister in the Lord ask me just before service, how was your birthday week? I added the word week. <laughs> she said birthday. It was last Monday. And it was wonderful. Yesterday was the end of the week, Saturday, and it ended on a little different note. I spent all of Friday, the good portion of it, with my grandson and my wife, and we did fun stuff. We crawled in the mud. <laughs> And we just, we got wet and, and dirty and we explored the backyard. It was awesome. And then he spent the night and I woke up Saturday morning to a little wiggle beside me. And the first thing he was on his knees and he just reached over, gave me a kiss. <laughs> yes, it was so great. But I'm going to tell you some truth here. So I had a lot of fun with that. But in my mind's eye, as, as I spent these hours with undivided attention, truly, to my grandson, there was this this thing inside me, I kind of imagine it like those horses in the Kentucky Derby, just, just their shoulders are just hitting those gates, waiting for that thing to go through. It's like, I'm okay right here, but man, I want to get out and do something for myself. And so when he left on Saturday, I was like, whoo, the sun's shining. I had such an awesome time with my grandson. And now I get, oh man, I had some things I wanted to do. And I hear my wife's voice, beautiful. <laughs> but I heard her voice. What's this water under the sink? <laughs> Immediately, that which I wanted to do, I could sense down in here, it wasn't going to happen. So I, I sigh, I walk in the kitchen, I'm like, oh. I open up underneath the cupboard, and I kind of look, you know, it's almost like you're kind of looking at a distance, sort of ghosting it, because I just don't want it to be what I think it could be. And I see this, this spray bottle that, that she had filled at some point, you know, those, those ones you buy and you put your own stuff in there. She had one of those in there. Well, it had gotten knocked over, and the lid was off. I was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and the water spilled out, so I get it, and I clean it all out, and I'm wiping it away. Well, oh, praise the Lord, clean up a mess, because I could still think about the things that I wanted to do yesterday. Oh, so I, I literally got to a point where I, I got on my, my clothes, I got on my vest, I had my keys in my pocket, I was ready to go, and I heard her say, I, I, I thought you wiped up that water. Did you miss some? And I'm like, I wiped it up pretty good, border to border to make sure. Oh, started to sink again. Pun intended, sink. Just making sure you're with me. Open up that cupboard. Sure enough, there's some water. Now I know. So I grab a bucket, put all the stuff in there. Yeah, there's a leak in my main pipe, the drain pipe, that goes into the wall that has plaster all around it that looks like there's, there's no connection. This is, I need to call Bob Vila. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, oh, boy, I look and I see the bottom of this copper pipe is just corroded and water is just leaking out. Just drip, drip, drip. So I turn on the faucet and then pour, pour, pour. I'm like, no. <laughs> All my hopes that I wanted to do. And it wasn't nothing spectacular. It was just me wanting to spend a little bit of time with myself. 
I know none of you get that way. <laughs> so I sighed, not like, huh, no, I was like, oh. I clean it all out, I'm like, God. Oh. And so I'm just, trans full transparency, I was mad. Because <laughs> I knew that this was gonna, and so here was my first thought. It's going to go, it's Saturday. Why does plumbing always happen on Saturdays, right? If you call a plumber, it's going to be, they're going to charge you 200 bucks just to show up. So I um, think to myself, self, I'm just going to tape that thing up until next week. Just put a Band-Aid on that thing. Put some lipstick on that pig. Just cover it up a little bit, you know? And I do this, and the reason I'm describing all this is because I believe you probably can relate that sometimes we get a little bit of bent, and where's the friend? Mm -hmm. Always there, but we have separated. I don't need a friend right now. I just need just, oh, I can't believe this happened. We get so caught up in all, oh, just, mm. So I head over to Home Depot, been there. I'm driving, or yeah, I'm thinking, I've already done a little bit of research. It's on aisle 21, bay 11, just go in there and get that tape, and I'm just going to put it on there for now, and I'm going to still do what I want to do, and then I'll call a plumber, because I don't want to do this. I probably could. I just don't want to do this. I'm just having this talk with myself. I get about three blocks from my house, and you know what occurs to me? I hear this just, just right here. Just I need to call a friend, but I meant... Not Jesus. Just, I needed to hear a friend's voice. And I started to go through this list of, of people, a couple people that I was going to call. And I, and I, I just I kind of reached for my phone in the peripheral, and I just stopped. And I, I knew that if I heard a friend's voice, it'd probably just make me kick into gear. How do you prepare for Sunday? You know, just, uh, just all this stuff. It just, and that didn't happen. I, I just kept, I'm like, no, and then, so the reason I'm sharing this is because it was that moment that I just wanted to vent. I just wanted to cut loose. I was just like, come on, this is just real. There's stuff leaking in my life, literally. And out of my mouth, I just, Jesus, I need some help right now. I, re I repent because my wires are crossed. And I know my wife picked up on it. And I, I didn't want to leave that residue on her, but I, I'm sure some was there. How could it not be? What did I look like? I probably, I just, <laughs> I just started praising the Lord. I started praying in the spirit. Interestingly enough, I pulled up to Home Depot and I look out my window and there's a guy in front of his cab. And I think he was a plumber because he's been over his seat getting stuff out of the front. I thought, that's interesting. Why did I think he was a plumber? Not because there was a sign on the side of his door that said plumber. It's what plumbers are known for. I thought that was quite hilarious. I looked over and I was like, full moon, right on. So I go in, grab my stuff, and as I'm in the store, the Lord just kind of starts telling me, don't patchwork this thing. Cut behind the wall. I'm like, really? Yep. Cut behind the wall. I did. Totally repaired. Got my mind right. It's great. I'm reflecting on that this morning as this friend is floating up, and I've seen that pipe as I took out a section of pipe that was about 14 inches long of copper. And see, the, the top 340 degrees of that pipe was perfectly in the wall thickness that it should be, but just that bottom section from decades of water running through there had corroded away. And see, the word of God... Jesus says, I'm the living water. He wants to flow through you. But what happens is we don't develop this relationship with the Lord that he wants us to have with him to be his friend. And what ends up happening is it's in our own efforts that we try to do stuff that we get corroded and the water will just leak out and not do what it's intended to do. And I was reflecting on that pipe and I was like, sometimes we just want to patch it up and go to church and say a quick prayer and like, hey, God is good all the time. Yes, sir. Then you go back and you get in a fight with somebody. But see, it's not until you go through and sometimes just, re, just repair. And how do you do that? Just get back in, repent, change the way you think. When you're mad, just say, Lord, I repent. 
And I literally said that yesterday. You're my friend. Come in and speak to my heart. See, Jesus, Jesus has the answer, but he wants to commune and fellowship with you in such a way that you don't need to call an actual person, that when you connect with him first, when you do call an actual person, that conversation will have so much more love on it, so much more revelation. See, the friend wants to tell you how to parent, whether you have children or not. The friend wants to tell you how, how to have a relationship with, with your wife, with your husband, with your children, with your coworkers, with the people on the freeway that you drive beside. Your friend wants to have input on, in, on how you move and operate in your life. See, we see some of the challenges, and those are the areas where corrosion has happened and the living water just leaks through and doesn't go where it needs to go. But by trusting in the Lord and spending time with him and getting in his presence and really humbling yourself, specifically when you're a little cross-wired, your mind's going somewhere else, just spend some time. Just call out to the friend and let, your, let the atmosphere here and your inner ear hear you saying, Jesus, you're my friend. And in John 15, when he said, you can do nothing apart from me. See, we often are, are a branch, but if we're not attached to the vine, we can't hear what the friend wants us to say. And this is why Jesus said, abide in me, abide in me. Why? Because I want you to be full of joy. I want you to be full of joy. When you abide in the, in the friend, joy will be there. Joy. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. Joy is more than the emotion. The emotion of joy is, is just a fruit of the root of what joy really is. Joy will allow you to get through something Joy will allow you to go, oh, I'm a little off today, Lord. I need you, friend. And that's an act of humility. Just by saying that and doing that, God will just begin to minister to your heart. Hmm. This commandment that Jesus gave in John 15 also, he said, this command I give, love, one another. That's what this is all about. That's, that's, that's what this is all about. Love one another. I'll finish up with this. I had a, a text conversation with a, a man last night and in the midst of all of yesterday and last night, I kept getting these calls. I had several families that come here that reached out to me and they were okay, but they were going through some stuff and weren't able to be here, some of them today. And I thought, man, I was so glad that as, as after I got right with the Lord, <laughs> that then when these calls started coming in, I'm so happy that it didn't happen before. And I was able just to share in love. I'm interceding for you specifically in a way that God wants me to intercede for you. But at the end of the night, there was somebody that I've been thinking about for days now who recently, his wife went to heaven. And I couldn't imagine. Oh, I just couldn't imagine. I was sitting there on the couch and I was pulled up my phone. They have that where's my phone app and I would see my wife's little thing blinking, and she was with two sisters in the Lord. I was like, oh, this is such a great time. And I was praying for them, and I was looking, but I thought to myself, I can't see her or hear her, but she's, I know she's there. And I was thinking that this man, that probably deep down he knew that, but he was missing her physical presence. And I hadn't talked to him for some time, thinking about him, thinking about him, and he finally reached out. And we just had this conversation. And it was really interesting. He, he said, I miss her so much. And I want to share something with you about those of us that have had people. You'd know, you'll notice that I won't use the word loss. Sorry for your loss. I won't say that. This is heaven's revelation. It's a promotion. When you read all of this, this is what this is all about. Our eternal existence with the Father, 
the time that we spend here in this natural realm is a blip. And when somebody's promoted from here to there, their revelation of eternity is big and it's grand. And this is why sometimes people have a challenge with God's timing. He knows it's forever. He doesn't, oh, they better hurry up, better hurry up. No. They, their revelation, they're whole, they're healed. There's no pain. There's no sickness. There's no disease. There's no darkness. It's all joy to the point that I believe that heaven doesn't even miss us. But we're down here going, this is what they would have wanted, and I feel this, and I feel that, and, and that's true. And it's not that we should just put a smile on our face when somebody's promoted. No, I'm not saying that. But allow the friend to come into your heart and minister to you about what this is all about. I've been there. I know some of you have been there personally where somebody's been promoted into heaven. And there's a difference between grieving for a loss but, and then allowing yourself to get into deep sorrow and check out and not allow yourself. To, I mean, some of the thoughts that will go through your head. But it's important to let Jesus come into your, your heart and to minister to you. And I was so grateful that I was able just to share with this man. And he finally confessed, yeah, I know all of this, but I guess I just needed to have a pity party. He said, I can relate. But get over it. And the Lord gave me some words just to be able to guide and direct him to say about that revelation and what it's, what it's about when somebody passes into heaven is us here still with natural thoughts and things going on and the revelation of pain and fear because it's, it's a broken realm. But Jesus can get you through that. Why? Because when you trust in him, out of your misery will come a ministry that you can pull up others that are going through the same thing. This is what this is all about. This is what it's all about, to be able to love. When you make mistakes, know the scripture says Jesus was a friend to who? Sinners and tax collectors. Well, you may say, I'm not a tax collector. Think about the principle of that. That's the least you could do for me. Don't you owe me just, I mean, everything I've done for you, and yeah, I'm a little mad, but you could just give me a little this. You're trying to collect on something. But the friend, Jesus, just wants to talk to you in that moment. There are people that judge them. He's hanging out, tax collectors, sinners, harlots. Hmm. We can get so holy in our walk that we're no spiritually good to those that have people that have need. Mm -hmm. But the friend will set you right. And this is a foundation that we can talk about that. But between Sundays, yeah, I find it interesting that right before Sunday, the leak started. <laughs> There's many opportunities to go nuts throughout any given day. I just want to share with you, just cultivate. How do you do that? I had somebody just ask me recently, but again, I don't, I don't know if I'm just hearing from the Lord. Do you talk to him? Sometimes we go like this. Lord, please, Lord, we're begging. Lord, please, please be my friend. He's already said it, that I'm going to be. It's like when somebody calls you and you see their name on caller ID. Just, you got to answer it. <laughs> Hello. And they talk. Just go out there. Hello, Jesus. Do it next time you're madder than a hornet. <laughs> Seriously. That is one of the biggest acts of faith that will absolutely change your life. When you are been so wronged and you are so mad and something is leaking all over your place, hello, Jesus. Just do it. Trust me. It will change your life. Big time. <laughs> Praise God. I hope you got something out of that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So no matter where you're at in your walk, 
no matter where you're at, you can have exponential growth. Father, we thank you for that supernatural exponential growth. Why? Because you've already called us friend. We don't have to be disciplined and and trained up before we acquire this, this friendship. You've already said to us that you are our friend, Lord Jesus. So we receive you today as a friend, as a guide, as a counselor. Father, I lift up each and every person under the sound of my voice. Lord, that in a moment of stress, contention, strife, anger, that they hear this word and will themselves to say, hello, friend, that your spirit might wash over them and cleanse them and allow them to fix the things that are leaking in their life. We thank you, Lord, that you have that ability. We praise you for it right now in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're going to honor him with just one of the most magnificent opportunities that there is, sowing seed into the kingdom. Hmm. Somebody sowed a $20 seed into my into me for my birthday and I was so excited and what I was most excited about was the first thing that I got as I was like oh I was like do I got two dollars I I can I'm gonna tithe I wasn't always that way and one thing I want to share with you the reason this man that I talked to reached out to me last night is because God had put on my heart weeks ago to sow a seed into him hmm And he said, this was awesome. What do I owe you for it? And that's what started a conversation and somebody that I was praying for and wanting to talk to. And I said, it's a gift. It's a gift. I didn't always used to be that way. But I've watched that as you plant seeds, physical, spiritual, financial, that it's an opportunity for things to grow, not only in your life, but bear fruit for others. It's a segue to allow the love of God to flow. It's such a beautiful and powerful thing. Whatever the seed is that God puts on your heart, yes, it's good that we give, but I want you to point your heart to expecting something in return from God. Why would I do that? Because he said to, he said, no farmer would ever put seed in the ground and not expect it to produce So as you sow, expect from God that he will return. Not only in return as it pertains to maybe finances as we sow financial seed in the kingdom, but when you sow your time as almost a tithe, spend time with the Lord, that it's like a concentrate and it'll bear fruit to guide you through your day. It's all sacred giving into the kingdom produces so much fruit. When you start being able to make a choice to see it as an honor, but to expect that God will do things for you, that he will rebuke the devourer for your sake, that when you sow, the the enemy will not rob the fruit of your ground. That's your house. That's leaking pipes. That's your children. That's your life. That's your workplace. That's your business that when you start seeing that as I sow, God's hand is on that, and I expect from the Father, because he tells us to, prove me in this, he says. Prove me now in this and see if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out such blessing that you have room enough not to receive. Prove me in this, he says. This is how much the Father loves you, but he needs a seed to work with. Woo, that gets me excited. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that the seed that has come that you have provided in the first place, that we return to you as your word says, and you shall open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that we have room enough not to receive. We thank you for that. And with a glad and joyful heart, we do. And we thank you, Lord, that you who supply seed to the sower will multiply the seed that we have sown in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.